Good afternoon once again, and welcome to another PCA Live. Today is a fun day because today is all about cigar rights activism. And with both the PCA, there's also a very, very good, important group that we partner with pretty much on a consistent and daily basis, the Cigar Rights of America, uh, which has been around for quite some time. But in order to have this conversation, we need to bring the man himself from the Cigar Rights of America, Mr. Glenn Loops. I'm going to bring him onto the stream now. Scott. Mr. Glenn Lube, the executive director of the Cigar Rights of America. How are you doing this afternoon? Cold, Scott. Where's spring? <laughs> Early summer. It's yeah. It's, the temperature says it feels like 39 out here. Yeah, yeah. You need you need a, you need another big parka, another Sherry parka on to do that. Yeah. I mean, last weekend it was shorts and t-shirts, and and this I know. Last night, late, it it dropped dramatically. See, this is why anytime there's any kind of pleasant evening, even if it is a little chilly, I go outside to have a cigar because I, there's nowhere to go to have them right now. And so that's, you know, <laughs> where I can go to enjoy them. So, uh, you know, bundling up and everything else in order to enjoy them is, is a necessity that, right now. That means the world is our cigar lounge. Yes, Every, absolutely. Everything's a virtual absolutely. cigar lounge. Wherever you are, there you are. <laughs> yes. yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, they're policing people for being out when they shouldn't be. So I don't know if they're going to, you know, come around your house and try to, you know, put a squirt gun on your cigar at this point. So. <laughs> yeah, the busy bodies. Anyway, thanks for joining us. Uh, today is is going to be a good discussion about cigar activism. And we're going to talk about it, obviously, in the context of, of, you know, the PCA, the retail side of things, but also the importance of the Cigar Rights of America and what the consumer rights groups brings to that equation as well and kind of some ideas and we can kind of we'll talk about obviously about some current events that are going on and mm -hmm. and apart from from coronavirus uh but also just to kind of talk about the importance of consistent activism within the cigar mm -hmm. um legislative uh fights um again i mean we'll talk about that but before we get started uh, I told you before we start, I'm going to ask you a couple of gotcha questions. And now uh, these are, these are pretty easy ones though. Um, so we're in quarantine and yesterday Rocky was talking a lot about how much he was cooking. So my question to you is if you had to be quarantined with only one kind of food for the next 60 days, what food was that going to be? Lasagna. Oh, wow. <laughs> Not, you didn't even say Italian. You just went straight to lasagna. I lasagna, because I can't get my wife to make it. So I was like, <laughs> we, we, we were doing our proverbial survivor uh, shopping last weekend, and I just said, let's go to the Stouffer's aisle, because I know I can find it there. Yes. <laughs> hey. This whole thing's been a case study of what you can find on a shelf, not <laughs> what is missing. Yeah, it was fascinating. I had to do a grocery store run uh, yesterday. After two weeks, we were our our supplies were depleted, and so I got the task of going to the grocery store yesterday. And it was crazy to see what was there and what wasn't. Fortunately, exactly. I was able to find the Bubba burgers that my kids love and get some of those things. But like, I've got a I've, I've been going to like Plan B and C when it comes to things like hot dogs or you know things like that or like the frozen stuff that you can get. So it's it's been crazy. Paper products though, like paper towel and toilet paper, had been restocked. So who knows? Wow. Maybe that maybe that's the first sign of coming out of the coronavirus apocalypse. Deaths going down, toilet paper going up. It's all good. It's all it's all related. <laughs> I don't know. If we can, I don't know if there's <laughs> correlation, let alone causality. But you know, I'll take any positive sign. At this point. <laughs> Outstanding. All right, another good question for you. Uh, if you're thinking about your perfect cigar experience, and, and there's probably many of them, but if you're thinking about maybe a good perfect one, hypothetically. Where are you and what are you pairing with the cigar? I'm not going to put you in a compromising position to ask you what cigar you're smoking, but what are you pairing with it and where are you? Well, you know, I, I say this in the spirit because I feel horrible as we all do about um, the impact this has had on all of our manufacturers, all of our retailers, the limitations on the consumer community. We can't emphasize enough the tragedy that this and, and the hardship this has invoked economically, socially, psychologically on our community. Right. So it's kind of hard to talk about perfect, but in the spirit of, of uh, what a lot of our uh, folks are confronting, especially here, well, internationally as well as domestically, I, I want to know, I rarely talk about what I'm smoking, but my friend, uh, Danny DeFabio Rodriguez Cigars down in Key West, I'm smoking one of his cigars. Because Key West is a ghost town, shut down. 
and yeah. uh, and I think of I think about Sandy Cobas in Little Havana at El Teton de Bronze. I think about the cigar factory in New Orleans. And I think about the tens yeah. of thousands, the tens of thousands in, in Honduras, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, that are Costa Rica, Mexico, Brazil, Ecuador. The whole supply chain has been impacted by this, like obviously no other experience in our lifetime. So let's go back to the perfect scenario. It's got to involve a, a beach. And uh, it's got to involve probably some type of a uh, margarita and uh, and a great cigar sitting on her, staring at the just staring at the ocean. And I think right now, what we would all give psychologically just to be staring at an ocean and pretending like the last couple of months didn't exist. And uh, yeah, that's just, it. It's exactly why I asked the question is because I think we all need some of a little bit of this escapism and where our where our cigars can take us as far as that headspace is concerned. If you don't use your imagination, you'll go nuts. I mean, yeah. I, it's it's. But you know, you and I are in the in our comforts of our homes and the like, and there's so many people that are far worse off than yeah. us. But I think about what it's done economically to this industry. The recovery time. I, I saw you the other night on on the. Uh, Stickman's podcast, and we yeah. he he shared some of my answers about the hypothesis on the recovery time. And I, like I said, in, in that answer he read to you guys, uh, let's just make this the most robust, economically successful fourth quarter in the history of the cigar industry. Yeah, yeah, because I yeah, think it'll know, take till then. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, you know, there's some very real concerns, uh, just as you were talking about. But and and these are real concerns right now. And I've talked to numerous retailers, and it's obvious with the brick and mortar. And it's 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 great that so many of them are, are innovating and trying to answer the call and doing things to drum up business. And and even if they're doing that to the stretch of their limits, it still is not the same amount of revenue that they would normally be bringing in at this time. And the other part of it is is that there's a concern that consumer behavior is going to shift to online because of what they're learning here. And I am, 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 a, am an eternal optimist as far as that's concerned, but being, you know, being a little bit more social, uh, I really hope, my big hope is as a part of that, the most massive fourth quarter in the history of this industry, uh, my big hope is that the craving people have for human interaction right now is what translates into that large fourth quarter. Being able to go out and sit amongst your friends, people enjoying cigars and laughing again and talking, razzing each other, being able to watch you know, different programs, and particularly sports again. I, I'm very, very hopeful that that aspect of being able to connect, because it's been taken away, people are, are hungry for it even more yeah. so to the point that the brick and mortar becomes – uh, a much more vaulted destination for folks than just simply a place to grab a good. It's a place for refuge. It's a place for connection. And it's a place for just kind of what you were talking about, your perfect experience. It's a perfect mm. place to go to get centered. And that's what a lot of people really like our retail stores and cigar lounges for that very reason. Oh, I, th I think there's going to be a big flocking. And I think if the social media community is any indicator of this, the support, for the brick and mortar retailers is going to be overwhelming. I just think it's going to be overwhelming. I think the way, you know, necessity is the mother of invention as the old saying goes. Right. And uh, just a couple of case studies come to mind. Uh, Jennifer Nicole offering cigar Uber to bring okay. you your cigars in Galveston, Texas. Uh, Dave Garofalo looking like a high school kid with, with uh, little Caesars pizza spiraling his we're open sign outside of yeah. the stores in, yeah. new Hamp in new hampshire the creativity that the brick and mortar community has exercised with curbside service uh the with the offering of limited use of lounges for three to five people at a time uh, and every seat being taken as a result of that uh people doing uh, direct delivery to your home right. van service to your home to bring you your cigars. There's so many great examples of the way the community has rallied uh, around yeah. the proprietors of this industry has been an overwhelming case study into what we're capable of when we're confronted with this type of tragedy. Yeah, I've heard of stores where their their structure of where they're placed had been able to turn it almost into a drive through where tents up and they pull up and it's a drive through service. Um, and, you know, here's what I love about small businesses more so than than 
massive structures. Now, we know how quickly the Amazon and Facebook and some of the others can go, but being a small business, obviously, the agility, that's a, you know, an overused word, being agile within a business sense, but seeing guys like uh, Alec at Route 7 Cigars here in Virginia, being able to throw up an online site and working, you know, so hard to get that up and going so that he can service his customers in new ways. Uh, that's it's all just so inspiring about how hard all these retailers are working to ensure this and and so that's kind of you know my hope that in, in our discussion here as we're talking about consumers and, and uh, how much you're involved with those consumers that as much as possible please seek out these retailers because these retailers are so important to mm -hmm. the vitality uh, and longevity of the premium cigar industry and their businesses rely upon us continuing to seek them out particularly in these times um so yeah, that was a, that question wasn't necessarily meant to spawn that that conversation, but that's, uh, that was fun. So um, so let's uh, let's keep let's dive into a little bit more about sort of current events. Before we do that, I just um, yeah, Alan Gold says, says hi, greetings from Chicago. It's it's in the 30s there today. We're not too far off here in Virginia from you, Alan, but it's good to good to see you virtually. Thanks for joining us, uh, and cheers. We got. Uh, from Raleigh, North Carolina. Thank you for again for joining us. And uh, our good friend, uh, Chris Nichols from Arlington Heights, from Arlington Pipe and Cigar. Hope you guys are doing well. I know that you guys have been doing and changing up kind of what you're offering there at your shop as well. You and uh, your ever energetic and creative wife. I know you guys are still going forward and doing a lot of uh, great things. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us. Please comment uh, on the side and we can answer any questions as we move along here. But first, uh, can you walk us through, Glenn, kind of what CRA's been doing amidst this crisis um, in order to provide uh, membership, your membership information, and whether that membership be manufacturers or particularly consumers as well, kind of what CRA's been doing amidst all of this? Well, I think we've been going down a, a parallel path because uh, you and I have had this discussion many times that there's no such thing as too much redundancy. So we've both been echoing the message of take advantage of the SBA programs, apply for the SBA programs if you're a retailer, but as well as the manufacturing community. And I think there's several in the manufacturer arena that are exploring the use of the uh, numerous small business assistance programs that Congress has passed in this emergency uh, expeditious fashion. So I would encourage the manufacturers. We've set up a separate portal on, at CigarRights.org. It's the first thing that comes up. On, on the home page, so manufacturers can go to cigarrights.org, tap that. We've got a list of the programs. We've also linked it to what, you know, you and I going here, yonder, and everywhere. I think the U.S. Chamber is, is one of those organizations we can rely on as a consistent, good source of information. Oh, my papers are blowing away here. Um, so we put a link. <clears throat> hold on a second. We put a link to the U.S. Chamber site. Uh, assistance site onto our site so people can access all the programs in one spot. Um, at the same time, I, we even consistently encourage the consumer community to stay active politically. And uh, you, yesterday you touched on that with in your discussions with Rocky and Josh, but we've really, really on a literally, a, I would classify it as an emergency basis, had to get the consumers engaged. Uh, in New York and Virginia as a result of these gubernatorial tax increase proposals. Um, absolutely amazing commentary in light of every tragedy and every hardship that's being experienced in all over America. But let's just take Virginia, which is now, a, I'll call it a blossoming hotspot with the, with the virus. Our numbers are going up exponentially every day, much less what New York has obviously been experiencing, an absolutely horrible situation. What happens? The governors throw cigar tax increases on the on the table. Oh dear God! I mean, isn't there a case, isn't that a case study in higher priorities? And this was included in the governor's budget in New York and Virginia, going back to the beginning in, in of the of the legislative year in January. But now, it, literally in the eleventh hour, of the last three days, it's had to be uh, truly stepped on. So. I was on the phone with, with your board member, Scott Regina, about the Virginia matter. Uh, keep in mind, a, a liberal legislature killed all of these cigar tax proposals weeks ago. The legislature killed yeah. The governor's yeah. budget kept them alive, the governor's budget. So, you know, it would be a 100% increase. So uh, we, we dived into the grassroots side on, of that equation with the Cigar Association of Virginia. Likewise, did the same thing with the New York Tobacconist Association uh, towards Governor Cuomo, linked to the legislature and the governor's office up there. 
in the last 48 hours, several thousand cigar consumers in both states have chimed in on that. So we're glad to see that in light of the, the way that obviously our attention can be distracted in this mo particular moment. So I would say that's been, you know, that's obviously been the course of the last week. Keeping consumers engaged at the federal level is a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, but we've also encouraged the um, the engagement of the, of the petitions on Senate Bill 3174 that Josh and your team and our team talk about consistently. It's the worst tobacco bill alive in the United States Congress. Uh, Senator Sherrod Brown has uh, promoted that. Now, granted, the legislative process in Washington isn't what it used to be. But let's keep in mind, this is all going to be coming back when this is over. When this is right. said and done, the, the government's business will get back to the business of legislating. And this stuff is still alive. And it just goes to show the virtue of having our organizations in Washington, D.C., engaged day in and day out. It shows you can never go to sleep at the wheel on the legislative and political process. We don't know what's going to happen from a regulatory context. And I think Rocky really nailed it yesterday when he said, listen, these trillion-dollar budget packages are well and good now, but there's going to be a price to pay later. It's going to come and due. I'm not kidding you. I can see the tax proposals coming in now. I mean, it's it's S chip all over again. It's S chip on steroids is what I would call it, because uh, let's just take for example, even with a uh, Republican Senate and the in the current House of Representatives. Well, this debate is obviously not going to come up between now and the, and the election, but it's sure as heck going to come up in 2021. Yeah. And that's when we're going to have to be ever more attuned to every every budget proposal that comes alive. And let's take into account what the total unknown of what happens in November. Let's just say for the sake of argument that both chambers in the White House take a turn to the left. We don't know if that's going to happen. We don't know if it's not going to happen. But let's just say for the sake of uh, just a little bit of, of imagination, it, it happens. We have to prepare accordingly for that. So I think we've got, with given the level of, of unknowns that are out there, we've got to prepare for, for every political contingency. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Josh Rushlow just asked a question here that I want us to get to. Um, we touched upon this a little bit it, earlier when you started talking about Virginia and New York. And for us, what we've noticed is, and, and I think you'll probably agree with this, because uh, you hit both on the state and the federal aspects. But generally speaking, what happens within the regulatory world is, you see a municipality or some sort of locality will enact some sort of tax or some sort of smoking ban, right? And then somebody else get wins of it in the, in the neighboring uh, locality, and then all of a sudden it's at a state level. And then maybe that state then, it's a domino effect of another state getting wind of it and trying to do the same thing. Oh, they raise their cigar tax by you know, 35, 50%. Let's do the same thing. We can get some more state revenue in. And then suddenly now you've got a national where there's a federal legislation that's being proposed. That's right. That's right. And so for, for us, that's why we, you know, again, we work very closely on those, the, the state component of it. Um, one issue that's coming up right now, I'd really love to get your thought on this. I'm going to put this question up here that Josh uh, Rushlow asked. So what can we do about states where cigar stores have been deemed non-essential and not even allowed to do curbside or delivery? And so I know there's a couple of things which we we've actually Josh is PCA and, and uh, I off the top of my head I don't know where you're you're located, but we have worked in some states in order to work to get some exemptions to allow our retailers to be able to do things like uh, delivery and curbside. Um, I know that there was a 48 hour whirlwind of just absolute dysfunction in Missouri. One of our members and board members there, Jessica Hudson, yeah. was letting us know that at first it was illegal. I mean, it was almost like you were going back into the prohibition era and her cigar store was basically a speakeasy when trying to sell cigars and told not to. And then it was essential and then they could do certain things. Um, and so uh, we have had success reaching out specifically when we discuss exemptions for what we are and what we offer, uh, depending upon the stores and depending upon the states. Glenn, I don't know if you have additional insights on in some of the work you've done in some other states. Yeah, with like Jessica's situation, we wrote an uh, email to the mayor and to the city manager that morning um, about that making the case. And I did a little cut and paste action uh, because uh, another dear friend of ours, mutual friend of ours, Wayne Anstead, Anstead Cigars down in Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, gave me a buzz about being deemed essential. And I wrote him some language. I don't know who. He had to submit language to somebody to try to get to become deemed essential. And I don't know if it had a role in it or not, but I wrote him up some language totally equating a premium cigar shop's uh, offerings as uh and a sundry to the mental health of the community. 
And I'm not being flipped by saying that. I think that cigar shops and, and enjoying a cigar is a part, if you partake, if you enjoy a cigar, and we all know the relaxation and, and the stimulation that that brings to each one of us, I totally equated the argument to mental health. And, I'm, yeah. I don't, and I don't think I'm being overly dramatic by saying that. If I'm more at solitude with myself, sitting on my back porch enjoying a, a cigar, as opposed to thinking about the tragedy and trauma that's surrounding me, I think that's a viable argument. And well, I, think I mean, in, just related I think in, to that. Go ahead. I'm sorry, sorry, I was going to say just related to that. One of the interesting things I was looking at is that people are getting confused on terms of anxiety and what they're feeling in, in anxiety and that what's happening in their chest and, thing, and mistaking it for coronavirus symptoms, right? Mm. And just kind of what you're talking about there, it, it really does, when you have a means to have a decompression, and cigars are so much like that. I just, I still remember the uh, Steve Harvey clip where he's like, you know, cigar is yoga for me, right? It's one of those things to where, where those who do it, they completely understand by that fact that it does reduce the stress, the anxiety levels um, in a very, in my opinion, productive and, and, you know, good way. So I think that that's an important component to that, but it's really difficult to be able to look at things like um, in, uh, certain, for example, just taking this related, I'm not sure how in for Colorado, they deemed uh, marijuana stores an essential business, not even medical marijuana, just regular marijuana dispensers as essential insane. business, but not tobacco. So, you know, we well, said, okay, that's, I don't know how you, you deem that. And so it's the same type of logical when you think about it and you understand in that way. And again, this goes back to the point, more often than not, policymakers, particularly ones that are writing policy about tobacco that affects premium cigars, do not understand the product nor the industry. That's right. Well, I had this discussion with, with Jim Clark in Ohio. He was a little bit more fortunate because he sells uh, different products that allow him to come under that. You know, he's a premium cigar shop, but he's got another side of the shop that sells more convenience store types of items. I'm kind of paraphrasing that, but that allowed him to come under that, that umbrella. Um, going back to North Carolina, watching what uh, Havana Fills has done in Greensboro, North Carolina, with their curbside service and being deemed essential. Um, it's, it's so politically subjective. And I yes. know they're having some issues up in Connecticut. Uh, place, I know Josh is out in Minnesota that wrote in about this. Well, you, you just know, said it, Wisconsin it, it, as well, where Wisconsin shut down stores with police orders. Uh, it's that's just that. and there, there have been police threats all over the place, and that's what Jessica was worried about in Springfield, Missouri. Exactly. Um, but it just seems to be a state by state situation. But so I'm not saying that any of us have a, a right or wrong answer to it. But I kind of like my mental health angle. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. I'm, I mean, I'm not either. Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, uh, like I said, I had to go to the grocery store yesterday to stock up on some supplies, and it was the night before where I was able to sit down on a really nice night and enjoy a cigar while while doing the uh, the Stickman show that you had mentioned. Um, and when I went to the store the next day, and it had been a while since I've been able to have a cigar and sit back like that, um, and I just remember thinking, walking through there, to be honest with you, how good I felt, <laughs> even being amongst people, and I was one of the very few that actually you know, didn't have a mask at that point. So it was just, it was one of those things to where I was like, man, I haven't felt this good in quite some time. So I, I agree with you. And I know that that's anecdotal and it has to do well, with me and, and a personal aspect. But, you know, Jay Davis here, I mean, this is crazy to me. Police uh, here in Dallas told us no curbside. I saw um, Jay's posting about that. Yeah. So this is, yeah, this is something that, that is, is, is continuing to, to baffle me in terms of this because – it's very difficult when you get down to essential versus not essential, especially when we're in an economy like this and we're in a global shutdown the way that we are to where there are ways to do this in limited contact. It, it, it seems to me that that just to your point, the more subjective it is, the more ridiculous it is and the harder it is to enforce. Well, I know you can go to a convenience store and buy milk and bread, but you can also go to a convenience store to buy cigarettes. And I think well, we're right. a, And I think we're a lot better for you than that. Right. Well, what's interesting is, this, is is ways in which some stores are getting around this. And so I've, I've mentioned this on a, a few times, but you know, my wife opened up a retail store on March 1st. So it's great timing. Um, and I uh, last, yeah, a couple of weekends ago, I was uh, ran out to go get something for her at a supply store. And in order for that supply store to stay open, they have a table out in front of a bunch of dry goods, like sugars and flowers and things like that, that they sell. And their specialty 
but those are front and center. And those dry goods, I think, allow them to stay open amidst all of this, as opposed to just being sort of a supply store for things like cookie cutters and bags and piping and things like that. So right. it's been, yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting. So, I mean, you know, I, it, it's pretty stupid that if you have to just simply say, oh, well, we're going to sell, you know, bottled water, sodas and candy along with, you know, our, you know, our cigars so that they will let you stay open. I mean, it's a pretty ridiculous letter of the law compliance that they're trying to push there. And again, this is where I believe that most of us see that because the pendulum was too far on the other side when all of this started, when, you know, the, the authorities and, and the who and everybody else weren't taking it quite as seriously as they should. Now this pendulum is on this other side as things have spiked and it's somewhat of an overreaction and overbearing now that's becoming more crippling than it really should be when you're looking at economies in, in stores and in, in being able to have the small businesses try to, to fight through this. Let's kind of take that back to where you began with the engagement of the consumer. Yeah. Uh, I think that we're going to have a lot of work to do as an industry, obviously, to try to get things back to normal. The manufacturers are going to have their task of up, you know, re-ramping up their, their factories in Latin America, uh, re-establishment and getting the supply chain smoothed out again. But let's go back to getting the consumer back into the shop. And I think that's the cornerstone. That's going to be a cornerstone part of our message yes. going into the next two quarters that we are going to be doing some serious outreach to encourage our members, our followers uh, of CRA to get their rear ends back into those cigar shops, get yourself back into those chairs. And I'm not saying do it prematurely, and I'm not going to get into that whole debate of, of reopening the economy. But when it is safe and when these shops are ready, we need to be doing everything we can as an organization, and I know you'll be doing the same, to get life back to normal. And that means getting consumers back into the shops, enjoying themselves in the lounges, and buying cigars. And I think that will do everybody a lot of good. The mental health of our, of our consumers, the bottom line of our retailers, the supply chain from the manufacturers on up. Uh, and so in that spirit, I, I, we haven't talked about this, but I'll just put it out there for discussion now and you and I can follow up on it later. But I would propose between CRA and PCA a joint task force purely on the subject of rebuilding the cigar industry from the bottom up when this is over. A task force that goes yep. to the heart of marketing this industry, uh, a task force that goes to the heart of encouraging our consumers to get their, themselves into your shops, your member shops. Um, you know, there's so much uncertainty, but we can start thinking now as to creative tactics, innovative tactics, aggressive marketing that gets our, 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 people back into those chairs and back into those cigar shops when uh, when the economy and the public health crisis uh, is ready. Yeah, 100%. We've uh, we've had many a conversation uh, about that very same thing in terms of well, when we're looking forward and projecting out, what are those ways in which we can assist in getting folks back to uh, the stores? And, and again, just as you said, combining all of those facets of why we love cigars and the industry to begin with, uh, really ultimately is found within the stores and the lounges across this country. So 100 percent. Yeah. And we can we can follow up and we can continue to, to do that. But um, uh, I think very much really continuing to engage consumers. And I think the more that consumers engage with us when we're talking about cigar activism here, uh, I think that the importance and also the connection that they make. I mean, a lot of friends are made within just coming in and sitting down and enjoying a cigar. But beyond that, as you start to work and you say, hey, yeah, you know, I was I was here, I participated in this event for this congressman or senator, et cetera, especially at the state level, as we've been working more and more on to have events at our stores. Uh, once they get to that point, then I think that, that the, the completion, I've, I've said this numerous times over this past week of what we call the tripod, right? We have the manufacturers on one, the retailers, and then the consumers, and we're that tripod. When all three are together within that, that stool cannot be pushed over. And, and really, ultimately, that, that is going to begin again, as you just said, with a massive influx coming back into the stores. And that's just going to help that supply chain get back on. And it's also going to help the, the retailers flourish again. Well, and let's hope there's a lot of forgiving landlords out there. I've heard that more and more for the cigar shops and uh, yeah. the cigar lounges across the, the country. Um, let's just hope there's a lot of forgiving landlords out there that, you know, don't compel some great shops from closing down just because they miss a couple of months worth of rent. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was happy to hear where Matt was talking about his shop, his landlord at Hattiesburg basically just said, don't worry about it. He's given him a couple of months um, uh, off from his rent to, to help him get through this because he obviously wasn't able to run the shop. So, 
Yeah, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, my wife had to reach out to her landlord and they were very understanding. And so, I mean, look, you know, you know just ask. I mean, all they can say is no, you know, in terms of that before, uh, you know, and we're continuing as PCA to lobby and to push to get more of the CARES Act money, uh, not just for payroll, but also for other things so that you have more money to be able to use for some of those loans or those grants for things like rent or in utilities. So we're continuing to push on that side too, to get some more of that money flowing. We need another round obviously, because uh, the money that they had set aside for it, uh, it, it, while it's massive, it still isn't enough to keep some of these small businesses going for the next couple of months. Well, I think the term forgiveness is gonna become a very big word uh, for everybody over the next several months. And I think we're gonna see an outpouring of mm -hmm. forgiveness in, so that we can all get worked collectively to get life back to normal. Yeah, I mean, and I think that people understand that this isn't, I mean, the switch is not going to just flip and it's not going to be, you know, in, in 30 days, we're all back to the, we'll get back to a certain pay. But in order for this whole recovery thing to happen, it's going to take some time and it's going to take some elbow grease. And so that you're 100% correct. That forgiveness has to be back for the economy to get humming along again. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, um, there's a question here um, that uh, uh, I wanted to, to ask you. Just um, We've talked a little bit about this. We've gone kind of back and forth, states and federal. But let's talk a little bit about more of the overarching federal issues. And we've got substantial equivalence that's staring us in the face. And obviously, there's some developments that are going to be coming down probably early next week from judges' decisions. Um, but what are your thoughts on the status of the SE rule? And if you had a crystal ball, if you were looking 12 months in advance, where are we a year from now with substantial equivalents? Well, one, I think we're go we're going to be lucky with the courts. I mean, it's just a procedural step right now. We're waiting on the Fourth Circuit. Um, I just read read an update before we started from Tom Bryan at the National Association of Tobacco Outlets. Uh, four circuits given the healthcare groups until today uh, to respond to them the way Judge Grimm did it in Maryland. So I think you know within early next week something ought to be shaken loose on the extension. What that does, though, is gives us uh, another opportunity to try to get some permanent type of relief from the Trump administration. It's ridiculous that these reports were even due in May and there's been no guidance from the agency. Right. Uh, it, everything is purely speculative. Um, so it, I think it gives uh, our mutual organizations an opportunity to continue to put pressure on the Trump administration for serious, permanent, standing regulatory reform. It's insane to think that with 50,000 SKUs out there for the premium cigar industry versus what's there for the cigarette industry, that we'd be compelled to have all these companies put in these thousands of reports to an agency totally unable to accommodate them, totally unable to process them, and demanding the same thing, essentially, from every single company for the exact same product for the wrapper, binder, and the filler for an all-natural product that has no chemical or nicotine manipulation whatsoever. That should demand a response from the agency that says we need a streamlined approach, a industry standard that speaks for absolutely everybody, and hopefully this extension time will give us a, a more of an opportunity to tell that story to the Trump administration. So yeah. the crystal, crystal ball is we get the extension next week. The reality is you and I and our teams will be pounding the pavement with the Trump administration, as we have been doing since the day they took office, to get permanent standing relief. And as you've alluded to in several broadcasts, and I have too as well, we know that this is on the radar screen at the White House Office of Management and Budget. We know that it's a it's an pending issue within the agency. We know that they are looking and seeking some type of guidance themselves right. to, to on what direction to send us. Let's help them do that and get some permanent standing relief before this administration uh, confronts the silly season of the election, you know, in a post-Labor Day situation where it's impossible to get anybody's attention in Washington. So right. let's take it out for the year. I think we just got to press like there's no tomorrow for permanent standing industry relief and a streamlined process that's adopted by the agency for the industry as a whole so that there's not 50,000 applications floating around out there on what is substantially equivalent defined for a premium handmade cigar that's essentially all the same for everybody. You know, the, the, 
just because you change the wrapper, the binder, and the filler on a cigar should not automatically make it a, a new product. They're trying to apply that cigarette standard to us, and it just doesn't work. So yeah. let's just say for the sake of discussion, that's going to be our mission mutually between now and November. We see how this election rolls out, and then we have this thing uh, hopefully ingrained in some type of concrete uh, going into next year. Yeah, exactly. You know, I've often talked about this, that it's the unintended consequences. And this is one of the things that, that people love to bemoan the evil lobbying uh, profession and evil lobbyists and, and things like that. But the, at the end of the day, when policymakers are out there writing policy, they don't know everything about everything. And for them to try to write policy, especially that they paint tobacco with the broad brush. And the very difficult part of that is, as you were talking about, they may have focused on a very small issue when it comes to vaping. And they look at that and they say, oh, okay, well, this has been substantially different than what a cigarette is, and it has different effects in, in how it's being processed and how it's marketed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They have no idea how that's going to impact a product like a premium cigar, which really hasn't changed since the 1600s, since its invention. I mean, it really hasn't. And so when you're looking to apply that, it's almost like applying the same types of standards of saying of, of eyeglass construction versus a telescope construction. It's two completely different, but just because you're looking through them doesn't mean they're the same product, nor should they be classified the same, nor should they be regulated the same in terms of how they come to market and how they interact with consumers. And so for us, what is important, I think, just as you talked about, the challenge that we have here is that what we want is we want to get a good, and I said this on Stickman, right? And it was a joke because the guy was from Texas and he said, you should talk about building the wall. But we need a regulatory wall around premium cigars so That's that right. regardless of what Republican or Democrat in office or control of, of House and Senate, it doesn't matter. We have a regulatory wall around us and and which provides us with the certainty and the clarity in mm -hmm. order for our businesses to operate, bring products to market in a way that is uh, effectively the same as it is now. So it's not overburdensome. It doesn't cost them an arm and a leg in order to comply. And it's a, it's a legislation that is tailored for premium cigars or it, it's a wall that's because tailored for premium cigars in order to operate. Well, let's take that back to where you were yesterday with Rocky and, and Josh. This stuff's not going away. This is an agency. Right. You know, let's, let, me, let me back up a little bit further. Several, several years ago, we had an industry meeting in, in Miami, and uh, one of the uh, FDA regulatory attorneys was there speaking to the group, and he said the, the following. He said, the difference between you and everybody else that the FDA regulates is that they genuinely don't like you. That's the difference. And I think yeah. that's a very profound statement. So let's take that back to the other issue we've got at hand. Hold on a second. <clears throat> we got that, you know, the industry got that stay through the virtue of the Texas retailers and the uh, and El Cabano, and the uh, manufacturer and, and retailers of Texas. Thank goodness that Judge Maida issued the opinion he did for that Texas case. But it's a stay. Well, let's look at what happened in just the last several weeks of the cigarette industry. There was a Supreme Court decision years ago, which said that under, you know, really a compelled speech argument, it sent the FDA back to the drawing board for warning labels on cigarette packaging. All right, you and I are rejoicing over this t Texas decision, but it's not permanent. And it's not right. going to, and it's not going right. to stop these bureaucrats from coming right back at us again. And let's take that, you know, again to that political unknown period. We don't know how November is going to shake out. There's, you know, it's been said a day is a lifetime in the life of a politician. And that election, yeah. we have to prepare for the worst and hope for the best, and however that shakes out. And I don't say that in a partisan context. But this warning label issue isn't going to go away again as long as these bureaucrats are after this industry. So I want to draw just a comparison. I love I love video PS because we can do visual, we can do show and tell. Yeah, right? This is a, this is some uh, some European cigarette packaging. Well, that's what they want to do now. Now to the new cigarette packaging that they just rolled out. Listen, the 50, 30% and 20% cigar packaging proposal, they were trying to use us for guinea pigs for what they want exactly. to do to the cigarette, to the cigarette yeah. industry. If they were successful on the 30% for us, what's covering 50% of a, of a cigarette package, you know, with the, and then the graphic stuff like they did in, here in Europe. Well, let me, I brought some toys outside with me. This is an actual 30% warning label. Well, let me back up a little bit. A couple of companies were worried, and they put out their advertising. This was from 
18 right after the rule came out. And that's what a cigar, a cigar ad would have looked like under these, under these regulations. So imagine that, you know, that just destroys the whole character of cigar marketing is putting a warning label like that. Yeah, right. exactly. And, and so to show that they're not immune to it, this is the same thing on a pipe tobacco ad. Yeah. I mean, think about it. pipe tobacco, getting that type of a warning label. So let's take a cigar box. This was one of the first box of cigars I ever bought, and I bought it because of just the box. That was an old box of cigars. <laughs> Does that work? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, does really, that's what we're talking about here. Or And what was interesting when we were listening to the arguments within the, the court is that they likened this to like you know, being able to put nutritional information on the menus. But that's not what this is about because, look, heart disease yeah. is the biggest killer – in America, it's not like you go in to order a Big yeah. Mac or a Whopper and it has 30% of it over the menu item or the advertisement. Or within a 30-second clip, you have 10 seconds that says, warning, eating too many hamburgers will kill you. That's right. That's right. So God knows this box you know, deserves that. Or since you had Rocky on yesterday, let's take one of his favorite boxes of mine. This is, this is the great thing about show and tell. I mean, just it's obvious that doesn't deserve that. But let's put this in perspective. Where the heck's that one? Where is it? Yeah. Where is it? This is what faces the public. <laughs> Zero. Zero. I, I mean, know. It's, uh, God, that's the kind of stuff that just grates your soul. I went into Kroger and bought that box of Marlboros just so I could demonstrate. <laughs> <laughs> There is no warning label on it. <laughs> I, know, I know. Well, just as you were saying, they were trying to use us as guinea pigs. And, and when it came down to it, it was really interesting because the government had, they were essentially almost arguing against themselves because they were, if you remember the, the argument about, well, if they're becoming numb to it, then you do need 30%. Well, if they're becoming numb to it, then 30% doesn't necessarily mean anything. If your warnings are having no effect on the public, increasing it to 30%. But then they were saying, well, we haven't tested enough to know. But it was like, well, if you don't know, but you don't know that they're not numb to it. It was a really weird instance to where it was just kind of funny because I think Michael Eddie at that point was just kind of sitting back and letting the government make the case for us in terms of what they had done and what they hadn't done because they were arguing against themselves. It was idiotic. And I think that, I mean, you know, God bless that government lawyer for trying to make the case, but that was an impossible case to make. I say that facetiously. I, but. I will, I will never forget. Um, you, all of us, were sitting there back the, last December, I guess it was, uh, during the first judge made a hearing, and I'm somewhat paraphrasing, but I pretty much got this down to where he looked at the government lawyers and said, "Now let me get this right. You want me." to compel them, and he pointed over to our side of the, of the courtroom, he, you want me to compel them to comply with rules that you're thinking about changing? Right. You want me to force them, and he did use the term millions, you want me to compel them to spend millions to comply with a rule that you are thinking about changing. And this really comes down to two different, uh, two different occurrences that really served as has served as a foundation for regulatory relief. And that is one, the agency even considered the option to exemption. That was the first step. And it shows the virtue of what Rocky was talking about yesterday of pursuit of an exemption made the agency think twice. And it was the political community that compelled that. It was the Bill Posey's and the Kathy Casters, and it was a coalition of today as of today over the course of the life of this legislation since 2011, 329 members of the House, uh, 36, 26 total members of the Senate have gone on record for, in favor of an exemption. Did that legislation pass? No. Did it send a resounding political message? Absolutely. And that's the virtue of having a standing legislative effort to use that platform to echo our message to any administration and it started under the obama administration and it helped confuse the issue enough to make the make the agency think twice and the second political virtue of, of the last several years was when dr scott Gottlieb reopened that public comment Maybe purely on the question yeah. of premium cigars yeah and and that came as a as a uh um occurrence 
due to his confirmation process, when people like uh, former Senator Bill Nelson, Senator Marco Rubio, Senator Joe Manchin, all confronted Gottlieb during his nomination process and said, if you get this job, you've got to do something about this premium cigar matter. And he was true to his word. He reopened that public comment for, and for the first time bureaucratically allowed us to tell a message so that it didn't get confused and lumped in with e-cigarettes and hookah and vape the way we were when right. the final rule, when the way we did when the final rule came down. And then as a result of that, more visual aid, the PCA, the CRA and the CA filed this document, 529 pages of analysis. And I've said this time and again, very publicly, if there's been any good that came out of this process, it, it has forced the cigar industry to take a look at itself. It's compelled the industry to study itself. And that's the way, the way this type of information was developed. It dived into the demogra demographic questions, the public health questions, uh, yeah. usage patterns, showing that we're not the threat to public health that the agency has tried to paint us to be. When they came out with that final rule, when they came out with that final rule, they did everything humanly possible to make it look like there was no difference between this and this. And that's not, I'm not being overly dramatic when I say this. That final rule tried to equate a carton of cigarettes to this. And that godly reopening of that public comment is what allowed us to tell our very, very unique story. And, and I think gonna, 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 I'm sorry, and that's going to pay I, dividends for a long time to come. It, it is. And here's the challenge, though, that I think everybody needs to be aware of that we do face. We sent in thousands and we had great comments and great replies and, and built a very strong case. And our case is backed by science and our case is backed by data. Here's the challenge that we face, because if it were always about logic and reason and, and backed by data, uh, it, politics would be a lot easier than it is. Uh, but it's also about influence and it's about uh, a lot of in strength in numbers, right? And when you look at the public health groups and you look at the antis and their comments on single premium cigars versus ours, there's dwarf ours. And the influence that they have on both Republicans and Democrats and also even in the White House presents significant challenges to us. So while that's why we, uh, that's why we have talked about this, and that's kind of one of the reasons that we want to close, we're uh, winding down our time here, is the importance of a continuous activism from consumers manufacturers and retailers uh, every day, every week, every month, uh, you know, and continuously, you know, it doesn't have to be big, massive protests or uh, marching on the streets, but we have to consistently work on our relationships with elected officials. Re the relationships are the currency that we have. And the more of that we have, the more power that we have to be able to get our message effectively across. And we have friends like state senators, for example, like Angela Williams out in Colorado, who are our champions when anything comes up in the state. And that's very important for us to be able to have that. And so that's what we mean by our continuous advocacy, because even though we have all this, and for all of us, this makes perfect sense because it's, again, logical, it's reasonable, we're critical thinkers in this matter, we've got the data and we understand it. But the other side is massive in terms of their pocketbooks, mm -hmm. in terms of their influence and the size and scope of which they bring for their political machine. So we're always, always, always going to be fighting up against that so for us, our, our foot can never come off the gas. So on that last uh, word, I just want to ask you, your uh, pitch to everybody out there, how can people who are watching this and who will later watch this support the premium cigar industry and the work that you're doing with CRA and the work that we're doing with PCA? Just give people your, your, uh, your plug. Well, first of all, this is the perfect capstone moment. I've got to get this out in a political context because this is about consumer engagement. I have said for years, you are no longer a cigar smoker, you are a cigar voter. And it's a critical that the, that every consumer let their elected officials know that they exist as a cigar voter. With that, I want to bring up just two things. One, it doesn't matter what side of the political fence you're on, the right, the left, Democrat, Republican. Now's the time to be telling our message to these candidates for president, Trump included. He needs to hear it again and again. And now that it looks like Vice President Biden's going to be the nominee, their camp needs to hear it. Listen, I, at Big Smoke last uh, November in Vegas, I had a diehard Joe Biden supporter from Delaware come up to me and say, listen, use me. I want to help echo your message to the Biden camp. Well, there's nothing in the world wrong with that. I encourage it. The right or the left. And I hold this up purely to demonstrate one thing. This was the poll done last year by cigar aficionado going into the presidential election. $100 million worth of polling done out there. 
the cigar aficionado poll called the election. When all the other polls said that, that Secretary Clinton was going to win, the cigar aficionado poll called it, which is an amazing commentary on the cigar voters of the country that they were engaged and that it means they should be listened to. Dr. Scott Gottlieb wrote this op-ed piece in the New York Post that said Obama's cigar trouble. Obama's cigar trouble because of what this industry means to places like Florida and Pennsylvania. We are a political constituency and we have to act like we're a political constituency. So right. I would encourage consumers to reach out to whomever candidate they're in favor of. Go to cigarrights.org, send uh, President Trump, uh, engage in our Twitter campaign to him. And that's where I really want to get some consumer engagement during this time of when everybody's on house lockdown is go to your phones, send the president a message on Twitter to seek regulatory relief for the premium cigar industry. We've got five different messages. Pick one that you're comfortable with. Go to cigarrights.org. It's on our rotation on the homepage. Send the president a message while you're sitting there waiting for all this crisis to go by that this industry needs regulatory relief, that your local cigar shop needs regulatory relief, and that you're a cigar voter come November 7th. So I think that's my cornerstone message right now is to act like a cigar voter, send messages to the Biden campaign, send messages to the Trump campaign that we are to be taken seriously in these November elections. And I think that'd be a wonderful exercise, especially during this time when folks are uh, sitting around thinking about what am I going to do next? Yeah, maybe cigar smokers are just a little bit more politically prescient than others because we were uh, uh, several months ago, we had already kind of started some inroads working for uh not for, but to, to get more connections within the Biden camp. And we have been successful because we kind of honestly felt like that was going to be a, um, the, the, the candidate, but also be, uh, the strongest avenue that we had, um, for that And Biden, I don't, would not necessarily be the most anti, uh, candidate on that side of the aisle, to be honest. Well, you. you know, Pennsylvania and Florida, there's no bigger States in play right now for that. Right. And, and Biden's going to be making a strong play for Pennsylvania. So, it's it's important for everybody to reach out and and you know at this juncture we have to play a little bit of sending those messages to all sides. In 2016, yeah. we had in 2016, we had cigar consumers handing out regulatory information and and our industry positions in Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina and Nevada because we wanted every candidate to know exactly how we felt about these issues. And that if you wanted the vote of the cigar voters in those states, you needed to know about the issue. Well, we need to play the exact same game in 2020. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, to be honest with you, it, it shouldn't be uh, a Democrat versus Republican for our issue. Our issue really should be a lot more bipartisan than it is. It's just unfortunate that one party has taken more of an anti-tobacco approach. And within that approach, and, and, and the anti-tobacco approach is much more about uh, an idea about what has happened in the past and trying to equate what has happened with the past with massive large corporations versus our companies that produce our handcrafted premium cigars. Those are two very, very different things. And it's it's difficult because you can sit down and you know this, you've done this for, for longer than I have, but you sit down and you have conversations. And while in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, they very clearly, no, I get it. I agree with you. I understand. But when they turn around and have to answer to these other groups, again, the larger the influence, et cetera, et cetera, and publicly what they can say to their constituents based upon previous platforms, et cetera, they don't necessarily publicly go out and do X, Y, Z. And depending upon how the vote comes down, et cetera, they you know, can't sponsor a bill. I've had private conversations with, for example, with a congressman, a Democrat from California who is you know, smoking with us and having a great time and enjoys the products and everything else. But then he's like, I... I can't publicly support this. I can't sign on to the exemption. Uh, listen, see, several years ago, I did an interview with the Wall Street Journal on this subject, and I said, listen, I bet we've got the only bill, this was at that time, I bet we've got the only bill in the United States Congress that's got Charlie Rangel and Michelle Bachman both on the same bill, and that means we are the ultimate instrument of bipartisanship. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right, well, uh, we're coming up on our time here. Uh, thank you for taking some time and for uh, well, staying off the cold weather to enjoy a cigar with us this afternoon. Well, listen, I hope everybody goes to cigarrights.org, signs up, yes. signs up as a consumer member of ours. Uh, if you're, let's echo the message that you and Rocky and Josh had yesterday. Every retailer in America needs to show up for PCA, needs to sign up for PCA as a retail member. There's power in numbers. 
Every state, every retailer needs to sign up with their state association. Every consumer needs to sign up, sign up with us. If you're not ready to make the financial commitment during this time, go to cigarrights.org. On the left side, it says grassroots. Sign up for free just to get our information, just to get our newsletters, just to get what's going on politically in your state. Go to cigarrights.org, hit the grassroots message, put in your information. We know things are tough right now, but you can do that for absolutely free. But let's just engage as a community. Let's build the base and be yes. ready when, when, and just be ready to go full fledged when this uh, when this tragedy passes. Beautiful, and and then also if you're a consumer that's out there and, and you need to get some sticks or you'd like to buy some some cigars at this point, please search out your local retailers. We have a resource on our page, premiumcigars.org. Uh, you'll see it right there, COVID-19 resources, but there's a way to support it where you can search by state for various of our members and kind of uh, who are offering new and different services or different hours to see what they're offering. But first and foremost, please just seek out your local retailer and find out if they're doing delivery curbside. Uh, you got to buy some sticks, you know, stock up. I guarantee you that the more you enjoy a cigar during this time, the lower your anxiety will be. Um, and so, uh, again, seek out those local retailers. And Glenn here is hoping that you get to have all the lasagna that you desire <laughs> during this time. Thank you, Scott, and, and best to you and your, your family. Let's stay in touch. Let's do this update again. I think we're going to be hunkered down for another 30 days. So let's do a little yeah. follow-up on this sometime soon. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll talk to you in a little bit, but we're always in touch. And my best to you and your family as well. Take care. Thank and thank you. you, everybody, for joining us. Please stay safe and healthy and enjoy your Easter weekend, everybody. Uh, take care.